there's a saying it says uh, so will will uh, machine learning re re redu uh, replace uh, radiologists yeah the, the the answer I had a very good answer from the, there's a uh, conference goes in, in Chicago they said radiologists who knew machine learning will replace radiologists who don't know machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> So what is Alzheimer's disease? Hi, this is Group A, and this is our presentation for the Pet Challenge Lab. Welcome to the game. So what is Alzheimer's disease? So Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder and is the leading cause of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is currently diagnosed by clinical markers such as the patient's onset of memory loss. However, there currently aren't any definitive diagnostic laboratory or imaging tests. And so our project has two main goals. The first is to analyze PET images for three randomized patients, the first being one with Alzheimer's disease, the second one being with mild cognitive impairment, and the third being a normal patient. The second part of our project is to analyze any clinical imaging or biomolecular biomarkers that could potentially be correlated to Alzheimer's disease and can be used for further diagnosis of this disease. So dynamic FDG PET images were acquired from the ADNI dataset, and we analyzed these images with the AMIDE software for three regions of the brain, the first one being the hippocampus, the second being the cerebellum, and the third being the frontal lobe. We decided to choose these three regions because as indicated in the literature, these three regions are highly susceptible to degeneration as seen in patients with Alzheimer's disease or those with mild cognitive impairment. So for methods, once the imaging data was reconstructed, AMIDE image analysis software was used for data analysis. Briefly, the dynamic PET CT images were loaded to the AMIDE software and images contrast and color scale were adjusted. The ellipsoid region slash volume of interest were defined. Of note, the volumes of interest were manually drawn using an ellipsoid on the co-registered PET CT images of sprain to quantify radio tracer uptake. FTG activity within the ellipsoid region or volume of interest was quantified with ROI calculate statistics with the following enabled parameters. Calculate on selected data set selected ROIs. Calculate over all voxels normal and more accurate quantitation slow. These values were then exported to Excel and FTG activity versus time was graphed. Okay, so we're gonna first talk about our first patient. Mr. Smith, who is a 67-year-old retired teacher. He is college educated with two master's degrees and is married. He has a history of diet control, diabetes, and does not believe he has any memory problems. He also has a pet gecko named Chad. Okay, so first we wanted to isolate the activity of the blood vessel, which is in this case the nasal artery, and we did this by analyzing the concentration of FDG over time. Looking at this plot that we have here, the FDG concentration decreases over time as expected because the tissue extracts FDG out of the bloodstream. Similarly, we did the same for the frontal lobe. And then as we could see through this plot, we see that the FDG activity increases over time and then eventually plateaus. And we know that this is due to FDG being phosphorylated and then remaining trapped within the cells. Moving forward, we then use the data acquired from the nasal artery to normalize the data that we acquired from the frontal lobe and then we also calculated the RCMR and obtained a value of 0.44 and looking at this plot we also have a similar upward trend of the FDG activity over time. So we did the same normalization procedure for the hippocampus region of the brain. Uh, we also see this upward trend of the FDG activity over time. And then we also calculated the RCMR value, which is 0.21. We then again repeated the same normalization process for the third region of the brain, which is the cerebellum. As you can see here, this is an upward trend of the activity of FDG over time and then also calculated the RCMR value to be 0.42. So to summarize our previous results of the RCMR values, the frontal lobe has the highest RCMR value of 0.44, uh, the second highest RCMR value being the cerebellum, and then the hippocampus has a significantly decreased RCMR value from the other two brain regions, indicating that the hippocampus has a decreased glucose uptake compared to the other two brain regions, which could potentially indicate some sort of pathology. So I would now like to introduce patient number two, Miss Jones. 
So Miss Jones is a 78 year old retired secretary. She has two years of college and is widowed. She has a history of breast cancer 10 years ago for which she was treated with surgery and radiation. So for patient two, we use the same normalization procedures that we use in patient one on all three regions of the brain. And here is a summarization slide of all the RCMR values that we calculated for the three regions of the brain that we were studying. So the first being the frontal lobe with the highest RCMR value of 0.29, the hippocampus of 0.25, and the cerebellum having an RCMR value of 0.21. And so ultimately, there is no really statistical significant difference between the three RCMR values of these three brain regions. I would now like to introduce our third and final patient, Mr. Bell. So Mr. Bell is an 82-year-old retired physician. He has diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, as well as hypothyroidism. He takes medicines for all of these conditions and they are well controlled. He also exercises regularly. So using the same normalization procedures that we used for the previous two patients, we use that on the frontal lobe region of the brain, the hippocampus, and we did the same for the last region of the brain, which is the cerebellum. And now this is just a summarization plot of all of the RCMR values that we calculated for the three regions of the brain. And as you can see, there isn't really a significant difference between the values of the frontal lobe hippocampus and cerebellum. To summarize or compare the RCMR values across the three brain regions for the three patients that we had in the study. For patient number one, Mr. Smith, in the blue dots here, he has the lowest RCMR value for the hippocampus region. For patient number two, Ms. Jones, in the orange, she has low RCMR values across the board for all three brain regions. And for patient number three, in the gray, she has the highest RCMR values for the three brain regions compared to the other two patients. So for our final diagnosis, we took into account the hippocampus for determining which of the three patients had which diagnosis. We believed our first patient to have Alzheimer's disease, our second patient to have mild cognitive impairment, and the third patient to be cognitively normal. Although we do know that literature has indicated that the other two brain regions should be taken into account for this diagnosis that we did not include for our consideration, which is the frontal lobe and the cerebellum. So moving forward, we do know that that could potentially introduce some source of error for our diagnosis in this study. Okay, so there may be some causes for artifacts in our data collection, the first being hyperglycemia, which would be relevant for our first patient who has diabetes. So if you have some sort of pre-existing hyperglycemia, this can decrease the uptake of FDG in normal brain tissue. Another cause of an artifact could be patient motion, so movement of the patient can blur the image or introduce some sort of artifact in the resolution of the picture. Another cause is calculated attenuation. So the calculated attenuation coefficient may just be sort of off in our data collection. So another artifact in our data collection could be normal aging. So as we age, there's a change in the glucose uptake over time. And this is relevant for our study because of the varying levels of age between the three patients. Another cause of artifact is substances or medications. So for example, radiotherapy or medications or some intake of caffeine, alcohol, or drugs can influence or introduce artifacts in our data. So some sources of error that we may have encountered in our study is first some difficulty in identifying the anatomy and vessels in our images. And this could be due to the lack of underlying anatomy of our CT. Uh, another is hydrocephalus potentially perturbing the normal anatomy and further complicating our manual region of interest selection. Okay, so as we previously talked about, there are some sources of error or introduction of artifacts that show that PET is not necessarily the best modality when it comes to diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. So the goal for the second part of our project is to find some sort of biomarker that will indicate early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. On this slide, it shows these five biomarkers and how they correlate to the development of the disease progression over time. So we have A beta uh, here and the tau mediated neuronal injury over here as a biomarker. And so the earlier that we can detect these biomarkers, the earlier that we can diagnose Alzheimer's disease. Here is a correlation matrix of these biomarkers with respect to each other. The correlation graph shows that variables that APOE4, AV45, tau, P tau, CDR, SB, ADA, S13, MMSE, RAVLT, learning, ventricles, hippocampus, etorhinal, midtemp, and fusiform could have a strong correlation with Alzheimer's disease prediction.
So looking a little bit more closely into six of the biomarkers and their correlation to MMSE, despite non-significant p-values, the MMSE showed strongly negative correlations with R value greater than 0.8 with CDR-SB and ADA-S13. The higher score on these cognitive assessments were associated with a lower MMSE score. Given that these other cognitive assessments and MMSE are tools used to help diagnose dementia, MMSE, this finding is not too surprising. There were also moderately positive correlations, including MMSE with FDG, FRAVLT learning, hippocampus size, and eternal size. These suggested that a lower FDG and RAVLT learning scores and greater hippocampus and eternal volumes were associated with lower MMSE scores. This is predicted as lower values suggest cognitive impairment or brain tissue atrophy, respectively. Looking more closely into the first two biomarkers that had the high negative correlation, we have the plots here, and then these trends are also consistent when comparing the distribution of these metrics across the control, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's populations. These box plots show an upward shift in the distribution with greater deficiency in cognition. It should also be noted that in the case of the control population, the mean CDRS8 is zero with a very narrow standard deviation. This is why any score above zero is an outlier, which is consistent with the utility of this test in determining if a patient has dementia. And then looking at the other biomarkers that had a weaker correlation to MMSE, the same consistency in correlation and the trends in distribution is observed in the other variables of interest. The concurrent use of both univariate and regression analysis highlight the use of these metrics as diagnostic tools. We then did a multivariate logistic regression analysis and we saw that the biomarker ADAS13 had the highest predictability of Alzheimer disease diagnosis. So in conclusion, the best biomarkers that match with the known pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease will be discussed on this slide. So for the molecular biomarkers, the first would be AV45 or beta amyloid, and then as well as tau, which is related to the tau protein. And so these two molecular biomarkers are best used for early detection, which could be used potentially in machine learning or research purposes. And then for cognitive tests, we had CDRSB, ADA, S13, and MMSE. While MMSE is the clinical standard for cognitive tests for Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, we also found that ADA S13 is a potentially highly correlated variable for Alzheimer's disease detection. And we do note that some of the patient data is missing in the ADNI data sets while we were performing this analysis, which could contribute some source of variation or error in our analysis. So moving forward, we would like to train on a more complete subset of patients that could potentially provide a more comprehensive and better result. We would like to thank our many professors for making this project possible. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you don't laugh. So Alzheimer's disease <laughs> is exactly Fine. like it. It's exactly like no as soon as you turn the camera on you forget. Yeah. So some causes for art <laughs> <laughs> That'll be in the blooper section for sure. <laughs> and the third patient to be cognitively normal. <laughs> Damn it, I, I got distracted. Okay, we can be doing it. It's okay. <laughs> So we wanted to isolate the activity of the blood cell. <laughs> what? <laughs> I do that all the time. Blood, blood vessel. Blood vessel. Honestly, you should have just kept it. You should have kept rolling. You should have kept rolling. Wait, that's the blooper right there. Okay. So. <laughs>